thank you all for coming today. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, we've heard uh, from Speaker Jones on some of their priorities for the upcoming session. Uh, I think there's some issues that we can all agree on. Um, and obviously there's some issues that, uh, that we don't think are in the right direction to move very forward. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. You know, obviously I think Medicaid expansion is going to be the hot button issue this year. Um, we know it, they know it. In what form we, we try and get this passed is the, the big issue, whether or not we will or not. Um, tax credits obviously are going to dominate some of the agenda. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Seems like they're rejecting the idea of the Medicaid expansion. Uh, they talk about some sort of a waiver to protect dish payments for hospitals. Do you think that they have a small working group who is studying that issue? Do you have a counterpart group or do you have um, a, uh, you know, some, somebody who can, or, or is, are, are those options available and are, are they good for Missourians? Well, first of all, I don't believe that we were invited to participate in those discussion groups, but perhaps I missed that memo. Um, second of all, I, I don't believe that uh, another option is what's right for Missouri. I think that expanding Medicaid uh, is the right thing to do. I think putting 220,000 more Missourians, giving them access to health care is the right thing to do. And we're talking about the federal government covering 100% of these costs. We're going to save the state $250 million over three years, and that's a conservative estimate. I think that's the right thing to do. But the, what they're saying is that by not doing this, Missouri does a responsible thing, prevents the federal government from borrowing $2 billion a year to pay for it. And the um, long-term impact of that is a, a, adding to the deficit and the interest that will have to be taxed out of Missouri at some point because the federal government isn't paying for itself. Why, isn't, why should we accept money that the federal government is going to have to borrow that future Missourians are going to have to be taxed to pay back? Well, first of all, the Affordable Care Act is in place. Other states are going to get this money, but we don't get it. We're going, it's going to go into Illinois. It's going to go to perhaps Kansas, Iowa. We don't know. These are our tax dollars that we're already sending out. I understand the argument that Congress is not paying the bills. Uh, I believe the Congressional Budget Office, when, we, when they passed the uh, Affordable Care Act, said that in the long run that this was going to save the federal government money. Given the Republican majority, how do you stay relevant this session? And how does your caucus stay relevant? Well, first of all, I think we are relevant. Um, you know, we're, we will have to be the vocal uh, opposition. But we don't want to just be the blanket thorn in the side. We want to be able to work towards a better Missouri. We want to put people back to work, but we want to do it responsibly. And if it means we have to fight tooth and nail for every, everything we get, then we're going to do that. We're not going to be walked on. We're not going to be put down. They do have a um, veto-proof majority. The last time there were veto-proof majorities in the House and the Senate, not a single bill got overridden, not one. So I think we are relevant. I think there's there's uh, people on both sides of the aisle. It's going to be hard for them to come up with those numbers. If there's a veto override, there's no guarantee that they can keep their entire caucus locked up. One of the things that protests, Speaker Jones and Pro Tem Dempsey have talked about cutting, some, make, doing some sort of income tax cut, possibly pairing it with uh, other exemptions or maybe getting rid of the sales tax exemption for internet sales. What's kind of your caucus's take on whether the state should pursue a tax cut or, or any, of, any of those type of things? Well, first of all, on the internet sales tax, I think that that's been the right thing to do for Missouri for, for nine years now. I think a study, the study that came out that said we've lost upwards of, I think it was $94 million over the last nine years. Uh, I could be wrong about that number. But obviously that's the right thing to do. We're hurting Missouri businesses who are trying to compete against these other states, buying their goods online, and not have to pay um, the sales tax. Second on the income tax issue, uh, Missouri is already one of the lowest burden, lowest income states. Lowest, ah, excuse me tax climate for businesses across the state. Lowering the income tax, I think, is the wrong thing to do. The speaker talked about having to fund public education. Well, if he's serious about funding public education, then why is he wanting to cut income taxes? Do you see a need to clarify? It's 
are still in a vacancy in the Lieutenant Governor's office. Is there a need to spell out how that would happen? Say that one more time. With the Lieutenant Governor, do, do you see a need to pass legislation to spell out how to fill a vacancy then? I don't. In fact, uh, I question whether if there was a Republican governor, if it would be, if it would be filed at all. Uh, having said that, that's been the system that's been in place since Missouri was adopted as a state, and I see no reason to change it now, just merely because the governor happens to be a Democrat and the lieutenant governor may get uh, a chance to run in Congress. I guess from a status quo perspective, how do you see that vacancy being filled for right an insurance interpretation of that? I haven't spoke to the governor on that. Um, it's my understanding that if the Constitution says the governor uh, may appoint, so I think there'll probably be some legal arguments uh, thrown back and forth, but it's my understanding now that that's the way it's been in the past. And uh, the last, probably the last two vacancies, um, Governor Wilson appointed someone who had just been elected. The previous vacancy, 100 years earlier, President pro tempore of the Senate actually has the lieutenant governor for the remainder of the term. And the, and the Constitution has not changed in, in, how, in directing how that's done. So we have two examples of how it's, of how it's um, how it could be how it could be done. And so why, you know, why and it seems like there is some question about whether the governor has the power to appoint. There's no direct appointing power in the Constitution or the statute. Well, does, does it not say the governor may appoint? Are you around that? I don't think, I think it actually says when there's a vacancy in the House, Senate, or Lieutenant Governor, that those are the ones that are not appointed. Well, I could be mistaken on that, but um, I think obviously there's going to be some legal issues. Um, obviously, that's probably going to be litigated in the courts if that's the case. If the Lieutenant Governor um, office is vacated, he, is given the nod to run for Congress. Uh, I still think that uh, the system we have in place is fine. I still, again, question whether if it was a Republican governor, if we would have this issue, this debate going on at all. I don't believe the bill will be filed. You mentioned guns during your speech. What, kind of, what kind of gun control are you looking for? Well, unfortunately, uh, Representative Newman is not here, and she was kind of taking the lead on this issue. Uh, we've had obviously had some recent tragedy in the country and not just in the immediate time frame but in the past. I think that some of the knee-jerk reactions that have been happening on both sides uh, perhaps need to be thought out. I think that we need to look at access to mental health. I think we need to have some kind of universal background checks. Uh, we, I'm a gun owner myself, and I have no problem with having some kind of mental health evaluation or some kind of universal background check. Um, we lost 10, 20 children not long ago. We look, need to look at some responsible, um, responsible ways to prevent that from happening. Excuse me. There's a one Democratic vacancy, and there's one Republican vacancy in the House. Do you want the governor to call special elections for both of those as soon as possible, or would you rather have the Democratic one filled first? Three thousand years from now. Exactly. Um, sure, that'd be great. <laughs> um, you know, I on that issue, uh, I think that the the Democratic seat, as you would say, has has been vacant a lot longer. Um, I would like the governor to call that seat. Um, I'm in no hurry for him to call the other one. But let's just, all joking aside, let's be honest, that seat is open and those people need representation. So I think the responsible thing to do, whether or not we need the seat or not, is, is to have representation in that seat, in all seats. Um, and on that note, I, I will say that uh, we, House Democrats, uh, Representative uh, Beatty and myself, um, we filed a um, a, uh, a uh, letter at protest with, that we filed with the chief clerk um, in the 150th. We didn't feel that um, Mr. Hampton should have been seated pending litigation of that seat. I believe it's the Supreme Court now. Um, 
I don't think that that seat should have been filled. Um, and we have made our protest known to the House. What is the, not having dealt with one of these, what, what, what is the effect of the protest? Is he, is that just to put your concerns on the record or what? what, what yeah, we, we did not agree that he, that, that he should have been seated. Um, that election is, is being contested. Um, all of the courts have said that we need to have some form of another election, whether it be a two precincts, three, or now, I think the appeal is to where there should be a, whether or not there should be a total revote of that election. Um, Mr. Hampton has never once said in the press through any statement or not that uh, he doesn't agree, doesn't disagree that there should be another election. The issue is whether or not it should be an entire state rep election or if it should just be in certain precincts. Um, what I would say to that is obviously everyone knows that there were voting irregularities um, that mistakes were made and that we need to have a new election. So I question whether we should have set or we should have had that seat sworn in on the House of Representatives floor when we don't have a valid election. During the last session when I guess you had 105, 106 Republicans, you know, there were two or two instances where Republicans were still able to override the veto. It drops down to 108 either because you know, Tom Todd comes and wins, or because the governor appoints somebody else. Is there going to be any practical advantage of overriding the veto, or is it really going to depend on the individual issue? Well, I think it depends on the issue. I mean, certainly, I mean, I mean, we both have ideological stances amongst our parties. If it's something that their entire caucus can get behind, then, then surely that's, uh, that's something that's going to happen, I think. I mean, but... On some of these other issues, some things that were proposed, I think that you're going to have a lot tougher time. Um, so I think it has, I think again, depends on the issue. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.